Yeah, you're all about the brain. I am. I'm very cerebral. Yeah, cerebral. <laughs> Let, let's go with that. <laughs> well, at least there was a pause. <laughs> This is the AT Banter Podcast, a balanced and entertaining look at assistive technology, accessibility, and its importance in people's lives. Join Rob Minot, Ryan Fleury, and Steve Barclay as they banter with people around the world about anything and everything regarding assistive technology and the disability community. Now, on with the show. Hey, and welcome to yet another episode of AT Banter. 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 Yeah, we're a little, we're a little, off a little today. slow today. <laughs> a little coffee. off. Need coffee. It's early, and a certain somebody. Oh, here we go. <laughs> certain somebody put the wrong time in the calendar. No, the right time's in the calendar. Oh. I just had it wrong in my mind. Oh, that's right. And so you told mm-hmm. us the wrong time. Yep. Where the, Good thing and you luckily, up. well, <laughs> luckily we pay attention to the all the work that you do putting stuff into the calendar. More, more importantly, we pay attention to the calendar. Not That's you. right. Yeah, <laughs> which is really surprising. Yeah, honestly, like your your track record is it's kind of fifty fifty. Like it, it, it could have been the calendar might be right, and you were yeah uh, you were right. Um, yeah, it's hard to say. No, I try my best to keep that calendar up to date. So. so. I love the fact that it's 10 minutes before the show and you're still not, and not actually sure. You're only relatively sure. No, I'm I'm pretty sure now. Okay, are you pretty yeah, sure? It's okay. 10 o'clock. We've upgraded to pretty sure, folks. Yeah. I am Rob No, and joining me today, Mr. Steve Barkley. He. And Mr. Ryan Fleury. Hello. How are you guys? Not bad for Thursday. Yeah, well, I think I mentioned that uh, I needed more coffee. <laughs> Yeah, you're not alone. Did you just get up? <coughs> well, just a little while ago. <laughs> yeah, dude, it's, it's 9 o'clock. No, it's not. It's 10 o'clock. It's almost 10. I was up at 6.30. Benji wakes us up every morning because he has to go out. Right. It's so our new a, alarm clock. You need a cat. We have a cat. You know, he never wakes you up at The cat doesn't, know. Yeah, there you go. He doesn't care. That's right. He's got a box he can go in. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> he needs nothing from you. That's right. Um, uh, did you um, did you guys hear about this the story about the driverless car that, that got crashed? into the accident? <laughs> yeah, the bus. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I got I, I, that entertains me to no end. Yeah, I think they'll go back to the drawing board on that one. And recheck the software. Yeah. Well, yeah, let's see. Self driving bus crashes two hours after launch in Las Vegas. The bus was started as the United States' first self-driving shuttle project for the public before it hit a semi-truck. <laughs> uh, but the real funny thing about this, though, is that as it turns out, the accident was not the driverless car's fault. It was the semi-driver. Go cool figure, human error. Yep. <laughs> I was telling Steve on the way over, I'm pretty sure if you replaced every single vehicle mm-hmm. in the world with a driverless car... And then we had one human person. Yep. There's your point of failure. Yep. That's the first accident that's going to happen is that guy's going to drive into one of them. Sure. Oh, I don't know. What if it was Mario Andretti? Um, <clears throat> I don't know. He'd probably spe- Is he even alive? I have no idea. Don't, don't know. Me neither. But Vegas is talking about, I think, 2020, launching their first flying car, whatever you want to call flying it. Flying car? Autonomous flying car. Okay, well, we need to get autonomous driving cars first before we get to flying, guys. Come on. Well, they're actually saying that Uber's actually in talks with NASA to try and figure out new flight flight lanes and we stuff for these cars. I don't think we need that yet. Well, they're saying by 2020 that you want to have one, in Vegas anyway. Vertical launch, vertical landing. Yep. Well, I know that they have some... They There's programs... Um, in Florida, I think there's they've, there's a bunch of different programs mm-hmm. um, all over the states that are that are you know playing with these driverless cars. So yeah, it's going to be an interesting uh, few years for sure. And we can't even get Uber here. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. 
you hear about the uh, escape from the uh, uh, Vancouver Aquarium? No. Some aquatic mammals escaped. Really? Yeah, it was otter chaos. Oh, <laughs> oh, I knew geez. this was. I knew it. I, knew it. <laughs> I smelled my, something my, my. fishy. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Mm-hmm. 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 Uh, hey, Ryan. Rob. Uh, what are we doing today? Today we are speaking with Sean Smith, all the way from Nova Scotia. Ooh. I'm not really Exotic. sure what we're talking about, but we're gonna find a little bit about a little bit more about him. He's yeah, he's in a, a very interesting field that uh, I'm actually an- anxious to talk to him about, which is this whole idea of, of neurodiversity. It sounds very interesting. So joining us today is Mr. Sean Smith, who is the proud founder and CEO of Don't Dis My Ability Consultation Services, which is a multifaceted company specializing in the emerging field of neurodiversity. Hi, Sean. Hey, Ryan. How are you doing? Good. How are you? Good. Thanks for being able to reschedule and join us today. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Well, I don't even know where to start. Let's see. Well, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and about uh, Don't Dis My Ability and, and what it is and, and what exactly uh, you provide in terms of uh, services. Okay, this is going to turn into a long spiel, but I'll try to make it as short as possible. <laughs> no, no, no. It's, it's, a, it's a one-hour <laughs> podcast. You go. <laughs> right. Just take a deep breath. So I, I founded Don't Dis My Ability in 2014. And the, the, I guess the brand Don't Dis My Ability came to me when I was working in the Northwest Territories of all places at a residential treatment facility for at-risk youth. And I had just been diagnosed with uh, ADHD at the ripe age of 30. And the, uh, the locum doctor gave me a script for some Ritalin and I took it. And the best way for me to kind of describe what happened in my head was if you can imagine an old rusty truck that somebody wants to fix up, they pop the hood, swap out the spark plug, change the oil and the gas, and then they go to turn the key and you can see the engine start to rumble, you can see the flakes of rust start to chip and fall off. That's what happened in my head. Wow. My thought process literally went from dial up to fiber op and, and to give you an <laughs> idea of how bad things were. Um, it took me four years to finish three years of high school. 32 attempts during the 18 credits required to graduate. I failed grade 10 math four times. Um, so life before my diagnosis was, uh, you know, not not pleasant in a lot of ways. Um, I managed to get snuck into college after high school to play football. Um, I didn't have the grades to go to university. I got recruiting packages from every major Canadian university with a football team, and I couldn't go to any of those schools. Uh, I staged up uh, John Abbott College on the West Island of Montreal, started recruiting at a province for the first time in the school's history, and they snuck me in. Hmm. I had hmm. an academic advisor or coach. Uh, still took me three years to finish a two-year program, undiagnosed. Uh, eventually moved back home to Fredericton, New Brunswick. My parents get tired of funding my football career and uh, earned my BA with a whopping 2.3 GPA. And then fast forward to being diagnosed and my brain just working differently, and all of a sudden the the haze, the fog lifted, things that I, I couldn't do all of a sudden I could do with relative ease. Like I tied my shoes the wrong way before I tied them the right way every time. Wow. Um, like I have gaps in my memory where I couldn't remember conversations that I'd had with people. I would trail off in conversations. Um, so knowing that things were happening differently in my head and all of a sudden I, I could see the world and process things in ways I never could before, I decided to go back to school. Um, I applied to the Master's of Education and Sounds counseling psychology program at UNB in 2010 and was accepted on academic probation and graduated a year later at the top of my class. Wow. So a very unique insight through which to, to help people um, and really just kind of going out working in nonprofit and realizing that um, it's not a nice place, uh, especially in the disability community. Um, you know, as somebody who self-identifies as having ADHD and, and having a disability, um, I recognize that most of the programs and resources available for people with disabilities are created, uh, packaged and sold by people without disabilities. Right. And so here I am, an individual with a disability and, and seeing all these inconsistencies and, and people who are neurodiverse, we don't do well with hypocrisy. And I kind of branched out and, and decided to, to do my own thing. And those people scoffed at me and laughed at me and they told me nobody would take me seriously. 
And uh, here I am, three years later, and been able to uh, take my, my company and my presence um, in around the world, really using social media, and it's gotten me, a, a, you know, so counseling and psychotherapy is one service I provide. I'm also a consultant. I help people with social media. I'm a, a keynote speaker. Um, I got to present alongside Temple Grandin in, in Florida in September, and I also interviewed her for my podcast. So I've been able to kind of get myself out there and, and share my experiences and, and people connect with me in different ways. And what I do to, to earn money is just kind of be, be myself and people come to me and offer me different cool things and projects to work on that, that keep me motivated to, to do it. Nice. Wow. Wow. Yeah, you make us look really, really bad. Yeah, I was going to say, you did all that, and you have a podcast? We're still working on just the podcast. I can't even figure out if the podcast is at 11, 10 or 11 this morning. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about the field of neuro, neurodiversity. Sure. So it's, it's a relatively new term in the world of psychology uh, that represents uh, a group of individuals with disabilities for whom the term disability doesn't quite fit because our assets exceed any deficits we experience. So it's another way of saying, um, I, I look at it as a, a form of giftedness. Um, and what kind of makes me different, uh, oh, well, I'm somebody who identifies as being neurodiverse and I specialize in helping individuals who are neuro neurodiverse. Um, so the everyone else has looked at the disability label as a broken part of a machine that once identified could be fixed. And the problem with that is that we aren't machines, we're people. We don't need fixing, we need nurturing. And so I look at, you know, and I acknowledge my, my own unique gifts that come by way of having ADHD. Like, um, I'm an innovator. I do a lot of different things and, and I rock them. I'm also an amateur chef and chocolatier. Um, I, I push myself to do cool things that I'm, I'm interested and passionate about and use that as the context to communicate with other people, um, to try and, and figure out what their passions are. And then again, use that as the the context for communication. We spend so much of our time trying to get people to fit into our world that we rarely explore how we can fit into theirs. And rather than and focusing on what's perceived to be wrong with a person, shifting that to identifying what's right with a person and, and just turn the impossible into the possible. I think that the, the other thing that seems really important here is, is the, the idea of um, invisible disability. Um, which right. something like ADHD would, would sort of fit into that category. And even just you describing, uh, you know, your sort of before and after, it's, it's stunning, like that, that, that difference that just that, that one medication can do. And you just think about how many people are sort of living with that on day to day right. that don't even realize that it's, you know, that they've, they've got a disability um, and, and what their potential could be if, if they were just diagnosed. Well, and, and, you know, part of the frustration on my end was, um, this wasn't the, so I had gone to my own family doctor before, um, on two separate occasions and she basically told me I was fat and that I needed to lose weight. <laughs> um, and, and that was, you know, like. You know, it was very frustrating for me to have to be in the Northwest Territories of all places when I'd, I'd gone to my family doctor. And I mean, I was playing collegiate football. Uh, I was in the best shape of my life. Um, so for her to tell me to exercise and lose weight, like it was just, but th this is the problem with an invisible disability, right? Is that people want to see our suffering in order to, um, to be able to contextualize it and, and to relate to it. You know, if we see somebody in, in a, a wheelchair, um, regardless of how that person uh, got into the wheelchair, accident, what, through birth, whatever it may be, based on our own biases and experience, experiences and perceptions, we have a predetermined notion of how that person got there, right? Right. And so with somebody with an invisible disability, um, and this, this is something that I've gone through a, a bunch of times, you know, you, you tell somebody that you have an invisible disability, say so that you have ADHD, and, and they look up and down and say, oh, they look you know, you look fine to me, you know, like just totally dismissed. And this has happened with, you know, friends of mine who've gone to doctors for, for help and, and they were already diagnosed and the doctor looked them up and down and said, no, you know, you're physically capable. There's, there's nothing real here, you know, so it's, it does get dismissed a lot and it's, you know, but it's, it's something that is coming out more and more with people because they're seeing the, the positive sides of, 
of disability and and there are huge strides being made in different industries uh, built around neurodiverse individuals. So is is really the challenge in the diagnosis? Is it is it something that's tricky to to diagnose unless you're looking for it? Uh, yes and no. I mean, you have to be. Uh, so in, in order to provide a, uh, a formal diagnosis, um, where I live in New Brunswick, you, you need to be a, a registered psychologist, you can be a doctor or a psychiatrist. I'm, I have a master's uh, in counseling psychology, so I'm not able to diagnose. But that being said, um, based on my, my own personal experience, it's pretty easy to, to pick up on things, right? Um, so there's... It's not so much that it's hard to get diagnosed. It's just that people people can't see it. Therefore, it's hard for them to de- believe that there is any actual thing going on. Um, they're trying. They just can't understand why the person can't be more like them without acknowledging, oh, well, they're actually just like themselves. I mean, it seems to me that it can be a real challenge for an individual to even really know that they would do have something like say ADHD. Um, how do we, how do you educate people, you know, to know what to look for? I don't really. Um, to me that it's, it's kind of a, uh, a, a touchy subject. Like it, for, for me, I don't see my role as on educating people on, on how to determine whether or not their child does or does not. If, if somebody has, uh, you know, an inclination where they suspect, I just suggest they go and get assessed. Like I, I recommend that a lot of people get assessed. You learn a lot about yourself in, in the process. Um, you know, your, your style of learning, um, you know, and it, again, if you suspect, then I just encourage people to go ahead and, and get it done because then you just have that much more information about how your, your brain works and, and how you learn best. Um, so I, I would really encourage anybody to go and get one. So what, what other um, things would, say, fall into the invisible disability category? Uh, autism spectrum disorder, Asperger's, uh, different learning disabilities. And, you know, I, I think even anxiety and, and depression could be considered neurodiverse. And is it, I mean, I guess the real tricky part about that is that all of those um, there's there are just so many levels of, of each. So I, I can I guess I can understand in terms of contrasting to say a physical disability where where it's very easy to diagnose and it's and it's very visible. That's got to be a real challenge. It is, it is and it isn't. But I, I would go back to saying like you don't you don't have a touch of something like a touch of this or a touch of that. You you either have it or you don't, right? That like there's there's spectrums and you can fall in different places within the spectrum, right? But each person is, is going to be different. And that's part of the problem with the, the system in society as, as a whole is that, you know, you think of that spectrum and how different people can be. How is it that we can try to use one method to try and help all of those people just because they, they fall on, on that particular spectrum, right? So, but really, this, so the, the challenges, as you're kind of describing, of trying to make the world more o- aware for me, it's just, you know, I'm, I might sound odd in saying this, but it's it's my being and, and me being the example and being the model and, and showing people what others, well, what I'm able to achieve. Therefore, you know, it's, a, it's that much more tangible for someone else. You know, we, we just, we don't have that many positive role models where there are more and more uh, coming out. I get contacted all the time by people who are diagnosed uh, late in life. And have become doctors and and all kinds of have all kinds of amazing careers and and jobs. It's highlighting these individuals and and showing the neurodiverse community that there are positive examples out there. And now big business has gotten involved. Like there are uh, companies like SAP who have uh, the autism uh, at work program where they are um, bringing in uh, different individuals with specific competencies that will help SAP. Like there are, you know, we all have challenges in our life for individuals who are neurodiverse. Um, those challenges are offset by particular and unique gifts that when uh, put in the right context can, can be used to do some pretty spectacular things. 
And I think there is more awareness too. You know, Microsoft's done a big push in the last few months as well on hiring people with autism and others with disabilities. So, you know, there is more awareness happening for sure. There is, and, it, and the big distinction in what's happening now is that before there, were, there was a charity-based model of, of employment where, um, you know, organizations would go to employers and say, you know, you should hire this person because it's the right thing to do. Right. And this is, this is uh, like a role that I found myself in a couple of years ago when I was consulting. And I come from a family of entrepreneurs, and I am an entrepreneur. And I, I couldn't, in good conscience, approach somebody and say, can you take this person on and lose money and value? Right? It, it doesn't make sense. So the idea with neurodiversity is that when you found your, your niche, your passion, what you're good at, what you excel at in, to the point where it is actually a gift, you know, something that you rock that no one else can can touch you. And so when you've identified that and you take it to an employer, it's, it's not a, Hey, can you take this person on? It's this person is either going to add value by saving you money or making you money. This is, this is the approach that's taken. Um, it's not, it's not the old way of saying, Oh, you just need to take this person on. It's the right thing to do. It's, it's specifically showing, um, you know, showcasing what this individual's gift is and how it can work within the company to benefit both individuals or both groups. Right. And I think people with disabilities, you know, there's been a lot of studies shown that people with disabilities in the workforce turn out to be not necessarily better employers, but longer term employees of companies that, you know, do add a lot of value to the company. So it's good it, to see. De it depends on, um, if you're looking at a specific, specific group of people, like there's a, a man named uh, Mark Wafer, out of Ontario, and he owns a bunch of different um, Tim Hortons franchises, and he he hires individuals um, with developmental disabilities, and he he really he, he's the perfect example of the the business model of it being good for business. Like his retention rate is much longer um, than than non disabled staff. Like the they're you know when you hire an individual with a disability, they're there is a lot of loyalty right. um, that goes into that, and and so it does from the business model. It makes sense because you're not um, every time you someone leaves and you have to rehire. There's a cost associated with that that the, the company takes on. So when someone stays on longer, you have to pay that a lot less. So the turnover is a lot less, and so there's there's the business model for that. But what I'm seeing in in my own experiences since I got involved with the the local startup community, entrepreneurs have been flocking to me left, right, and mm -hmm. and center. And I would venture to say there's probably more entrepreneurs uh, who are neurodiverse who are diagnosed or undiagnosed than there are without. Wow. Yeah, I mean, I think it's I think it's brilliant, and I think it, it's great because you you accentuate the positive, right? You you talk about what you know what the gift is as opposed to what the limitation is, um, and I, and I think that that you know it works across the board, both with visible and invisible disability. So I think it's you know I love this term of of neurodiversity because you know again it's just it's it's just differences as opposed to well, you know, you have limitations and I don't. Right. The, the sad part is that I'm a for-profit and what I'm doing, although it seems common sense, is unfortunately cutting edge. And so the, the model that's being used, and this is where I challenge nonprofit, who would say, you know, our, our goal is to promote independence. Um, and then I come up and say, you're dependent on these individuals you support to be sustainable. How much independence can you actually promote? Because without them, there's no you. Right. Mm -hmm. And so this is this is what you know. A big part of my challenge from a, a systemic point of view is really trying to you know um, stir the pot, as we <laughs> as I say. You know, like because I'm I'm you know I'm I don't I'm my own boss. I I don't receive funding from a, a, a government organization um, who you know, can pull rank over me. Um, so I don't, I don't have to tote any line, but mine, but I can also say with confidence that I'm also the, the head of my business and I'm somebody with a disability, whereas, um, very few of the others could. So no, no one can really tell me that I'm wrong. 
I guess is what it comes down to. <laughs> right. It's a good position to be in. My, my wife has that condition too. Um, <laughs> um, at work. Let's, let's just say at work. So, I mean, you, you weren't diagnosed until you were an adult. Uh, obviously, you know, some, somewhere along the, the lines, the school system failed to identify that, that you were learning differently and, and, and address that in any way. Do you, do you see that improving in, in the school systems now? No. I mean, yes, yes, but no, it's, it's different now than, than it was then. And so when I was in school, um, you know, my parent, my parents are from New Brunswick. They both came from small villages and, it, you know, it was just a different time, you know, to admit that there was something wrong with your kid was then perceived as a reflection of poor parenting, right? It was what, what people would blame the parents. Well, what did you do for your kid to end up this way? So it was kind of like, you know, um, Christmas is coming up, and it kind of reminds me of the, the whole Rudolph uh, thing where they cover his nose, mm-hmm. you know? So it's like, you know, we're just, we're going to try and make it seem as though nothing's really happening. And, but, you know, my parents would, geez, man, like I had to sit down at the table for almost two hours every night, um, one semester, because I filled all of my classes. You know, they, they tried a lot of different things, but none of them worked. And I, and as an adult now, um, and having all the experiences that I have, uh, personally and professionally, um, being diagnosed and going back to school, you know, I'm, I'm able to, to see what they did and, and why it didn't work and the mistakes that parents are now making with their kids. And so, you know, I wear a lot of hats, but as, as a counselor and psychotherapist, I'm also a, a parenting expert. And so the bulk of my work is not with the kids. It's not. And I describe it as the, the square peg in the round hole situation where, you know, if we look at the, the square peg as the individual with a disability. You know, we've put all our resources and, and time and energy into trying to shift, contort and manipulate that square peg. It's beautiful. It's not going anywhere. So I describe my work as expanding the round hole. I don't need to work to change the kids, right? They don't need changing. What needs to change is the way that the parents communicate with them and, and understand their perspective and, and point of view in a way that they just haven't been able to because nobody's presented um, the information or the insight to them in a way that, that they could. Everyone else has just looked at the, the diagnosis or the behavior as though that's what needs to be addressed and using, you know, and they've had some success, but the problem is you can't use the same thing for everybody. And there's just not enough experts around who have the experience of, you know, this is my 20th job. I've literally done everything from shovel manure to um, short order cook. I was a, a blackjack dealer for a summer in Lake Tahoe. I was a sheriff's officer and worked two murder trials. Wow. I was a therapeutic foster parent for at-risk youth um, in the state of Maine with my wife. And then again, you know, working in the Northwest Territories twice. Wow. So a lot of experience working with uh, neurodiverse kids without ever knowing that what neurodiversity was. And, and, but looking back and seeing all these kids that I worked with, there, there's a huge community out there. It's just trying to pull everybody together to, you know, I guess I would kind of, I describe this as X-Men. So what we need to work on <laughs> is the Cerebro. Call them to you. <laughs> well, you know, it's, um, so again, I have a lot of gifts and one of them is I can walk into a room and structurally I can tell you everything that's off. It's a gift and a curse. I can also do the same thing with people. Like I, I can tell within minutes of meeting someone, um, how genuine and authentic they are. And if they're not, then I go my merry way, but it's, uh, it's an interesting thing. So is the field, is, is this, is it a growing field right now? Yes, Absolutely. Is, is it is it is there a large growth or is it still sort of building a bit of a groundswell? Well, I can only speak to my experience. Well, in in New Brunswick, it is um, you know everywhere else I've lived and come back, New Brunswick has always felt like a step back in time. So in in other provinces, it it may be more to the forefront, but really where I see the the biggest. Um, push for this is in the US and in the UK. And I haven't been to the UK, but I people will send me articles all the time of all these innovative things that are happening. I actually get groups who uh, who find me through social media and, and contact me uh, to let me know about some of the cool stuff they're doing. So it's, it's, it's pretty interesting 
but I would say the states are a little bit behind of uh, the UK, but it, there is a, a pretty big push. Um, you know, it's it's just a, a perfect. It makes perfect business sense. You know, it's it's going to create independence. It's going to create jobs. Um, yeah. You know, and there's a big push for entrepreneurship, and and the neurodiverse. Like there are a lot of people with um, invisible disabilities who are. Um, who are startup companies. And this is something that I encourage and, and promote, you know, if you want to be independent, um, it's, it's hard to actually be independent when you're always working for somebody else, but true independence will come if you're your own employer. That's so right. really pushing people towards that because, you know, the parents and grandparents and people around these kids will tell them to work. Well, they have a lot of different issues that maybe they, they can't work. You know, they, they process information and, and sense things differently. And so, they may need a different type of environment. So maybe going to work at, you know, McDonald's or a, a busy place isn't going to be for them. But who's to say that if they really love pets, that they can't start their own dog walking business and earn money that way. So is that kind of where you sort of step in in terms of the counseling? Like you would, you would take somebody and, and try to walk them through and try to find that, that strength that they have and, and sort of draw it out of them? In some cases, but really what I described happens in most conversations that I have with anybody I meet. Um, this is, these are things that I pick up on like really quickly. Uh, but uh, it, in most cases, when it comes to counseling and psychotherapy, what I'm doing is working with the parents and grandparents to provide insight into their child or, or um, grandchild's thought process, not, not excusing any type of behavior, but helping them to understand um, the perspective of the child, uh, which, which helps them then see what role they had in, in what's going on, as opposed to telling them what they need to do to fix their kid. It's, it's a bottom up versus a top down process. See, and I, I, the sense that I get that and this is why this is really important, I think, is because you, this takes everything and sort of turns it 90 degrees. Um, as opposed to like how it's been done traditionally. Um, you know, generally you, you're absolutely right. I mean, they would, they would, they would work with the kid. They would, they would, um, you know, uh, prescribe whatever drug and, and try to modify the behavior and without, you know, working with the family members and working with the system or working with the employers of the school system. And I think that that's really what needs to change uh, in order to really, really evoke a lot of change. I think there's also a real issue with um, misdiagnosis within the school system as well, because it takes a very long time to actually, you know, once a kid is identified, at least th this was my experience here in BC with my daughter. Um, once she was identified as having trouble in school, um, she had a teacher who was the special needs teacher in her elementary school who diagnosed her with three different things over three different, oh, I guess over the, the space of a year, she had diagnosed her with uh, attention deficit disorder, dyslexia, and uh, I believe malnutrition at one point. Um, and, uh, and she knew because her, her sons had, had learning dis disabilities. So, so she was the expert on this and, uh, and she was taking courses in, uh, in how to identify these things. And, uh, we finally got fed up with, with her diagnoses and, and waiting for, uh, a, a psychologist from the school system to be able to see her. There's like a two year waiting list. So we went out and we had her privately, um, assessed. And it turns out she didn't have any of those problems. She had a written output disorder. She, she just couldn't write as fast as she could think. So she was doing minimal written output. Hmm. As soon as we gave her a keyboard to type on instead of handwriting, it, it totally changed her, her school career. She's, she's an honor roll student now. Wow. Right. Yep. And th there's a lot of the, I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb and guess that the, the, the education system where you are is, is better equipped than where I am. Um, I, you know, I've, I'm not a, I'm always the exception to the rule. So I have my master's of education, but I don't have my bachelor's of education, so I don't know how to teach the wrong way. Um, but I can look at it and tell you what's wrong. <laughs> right. um, and, you know, there are a lot of these students who aren't, aren't assessed, but they're, um, 
you know, their, their curriculum is modified and they're put on, um, uh, different learning plans that, you know, if in high school can affect their ability to attend post-secondary when they're done. Yeah. And so they're modifying their curriculum without any type of assessment. And so in New Brunswick, what happened was we had school psychologists, and I think they used to say it would be a year wait list. And then new government, they decided to change things. They let a bunch of the school psychologists go, hired behavioral interventionists. That didn't work, but they didn't bring back all the school psychologists. So now they can't tell you when you'd get assessed. So now if you don't have the money to pay for it privately, what do you do, right? And so a lot of these kids are, are not doing well in school. Um, and it's the vicious cycle that I went through, right? Kid brings home the report card, parents aren't happy, parent uh, consequences the kid, and it just goes around and around and around and, and around. And it's it doesn't work. The, they're not, you know, inclusion in, I guess the way I describe it is an illusion, really. I mean, if the goal of inclusion is to get kids with disabilities to be more like kids without disabilities, then that's assimilation, mm. right? Yeah, right. It's, so, again, somebody packaged it nice and sold it as inclusion, but really it's, it's not. Um, inclusion is when somebody's doing uh, learning what it is they need to learn in the way that they learn it. Right. And, and in the environment that is conducive to that learning. And that's not, that may not be with three, four, or 30 other students in a class with, um, you know, desks opening and closing and pens clicking and lights humming. You know, like all of these things are not taken into consideration. It's, you know, you may need an EA or a TA, which in New Brunswick is only like, I believe you need a criminal record check, a vulnerable sector check, and a high school diploma. You know, so the people who require the, the highest level of support are, you know, taken care of or taught by the people with the least education and the least experience. Where do you see the greatest need? Uh, like, is, is it are you starting at the school systems and working, working upwards to employers or is it just everywhere? It's really everywhere. Uh, I... Every, every door that I've tried to knock on has been closed uh, locally. So I just keep trying to, you know, put out my message in, in different ways, and it's going to get to the point where they, they can't ignore me. Um, <laughs> I, had a, I did have a meeting last month with a uh, senior government official with, with education and, and let them know, you know, basically I went in to present and introduce myself, and, and um, you know, they, they expressed a, a desire to collaborate. Whether or not that will happen, I don't know. But as long as we're buying packages um, and the idea is that it's going to work for everybody, it, it won't and it can't. You know, and, and I call when people tell me, you know, parents, grandparents will say, oh, I've been reading these books or I'm looking for these articles. I just tell them to stop mm -hmm. because all these people who have written these, these books and created these resources have essentially created like a, a fad diet. Right. And when, and when it doesn't work the person doesn't blame the author they blame themselves or they blame their kid. Right. Right. And it, but it's, you know, people are packaging garbage and putting it out there and, and saying like, this is what's going to work next. Well, that's what happened with the Atkins diet. Right. Mm -hmm. this is, it's, it's the same thing. Um, it just goes through cycles and, and people want this, they want help for their kids so badly, you know, they're, they're praying. These companies are preying on their insecurities and, Turn this have turned this into a market to sell garbage to people who are so desperate to help their child that they'll buy anything. Well, it's definitely a perspective that you know we don't always think about. We kind of look at the other way around. So this has really, really been for me anyway, eye opening and yeah, this is a new way to look at it. It's incredibly important um, because you know what what we have been doing traditionally just isn't working, um, and the fact that that uh, every single individual is is different and there's going to be a different way that they're going to, you know, see the world. And it's important to change the system as opposed to trying to change them. Tell people where they can find you on the web or how to get in touch with you or how they can learn more about a neurodiversity. Sure. You can follow me on Twitter. Um, I've got a Facebook page, a YouTube channel. I'm also on Instagram. 
Uh, I'm I'm pretty you name the social media platform and, and you can likely <laughs> find me there. You can also check out my website, www.ddmacs.com, so ddmax.com. Um, you can subscribe for my newsletter and hear more about what I'm exciting things I'm up to. I just uh, won a national entrepreneurship award through Startup Canada. Hey. So that was hey. pretty exciting. Awesome. So I, I send out updates on uh, all the cool stuff I'm up to, and and a lot of people like to sign up and join me for the ride. So awesome! Yeah, we'll make sure we link to all of those in our show notes as well. Perfect. So you also have a podcast. Why don't you tell us what that one's all about? Sure. I had the the Job Creators Radio Show, uh, which was uh, a partnership with a company called Picasso Einstein. And they're a, a group based out of Florida who, again, found me through social media. And Picasso Weinstein uh, is kind of a, an online accelerator program um, for startups. The interesting part is that it's for individuals with developmental disabilities. And so they, they've kind of created this brand of helping individuals with disabilities get their own startup going. And so they we just kind of drived in um, – we collaborated on the job creators radio and they just, they had so many great connections. They, my first interview was, uh, Amy Cosper, former editor in chief of entrepreneur magazine. Wow. Um, Steven Rohr, uh, who's a publicist for the Oscars, uh, Temple Grandin, who's an international autism advocate. And so we've gone our, our separate ways with the podcast. Um, our, we've just kind of dissolved our, our agreement. And so they've gifted me the, the four podcasts that I have, the four episodes, and I'm rebranding, and the new podcast will be called the Don't Dis My Ability Podcast with Sean Smith. Fantastic. And so you can look for that sometime in early 2018. Hey, excellent. excellent. Yeah. Well, I wondered if you guys uh, um, have any cool gadgets that you, uh, you would like to share. What do you want? <laughs> well, I just, so like, I, I'm a techie and I love, um, I just love different uh, stuff. I have a, a bunch of little things. I've got a, a, a Riff 6 pocket projector, which is pretty cool. Nice. Yeah. yeah I've, been, so I just, I've been eyeing those little projectors the last little while. Yeah, I've had mine. I haven't used it much, but it's it's cool. And I I bought it so that when I go to um, conferences as a presenter, I don't have a bring, I don't have to bring a banner. I can just turn that on and I can get a, I can use the same Id, image or I can use, I can create a slideshow mm -hmm. and it'll display behind me. Nice. Uh, how, how do you find it brightness wise in a, in a lit room? Uh, not so great in a lit room, but one of the things that I'm, I'm going to try is to, um, build, probably put, uh, you know how a, a roof kind of overhangs over a building. Mm hmm. I'm going to try and, and do kind of a, a similar thing to the, the top to try and block out the, the primary source of light. Okay. And and see how that works. But for me, it's, it's it's actually not bad because of my logo design and how I created it. So it's it's a black background with white and silver. So really, no matter what, you know, how light, well, I guess the light might affect it, but what color of the paint or wall doesn't really matter. It still should still show up. Right. Yeah. yeah, as far as as far as tech goes, uh, about the only new thing we got is the Polaris Braille display I just brought for Ryan to play with today. Oh, nice. So it's an electronic refreshable Braille uh, Android computer. Uh, it's got uh, 32 cells of Braille sitting in front of a Braille keyboard, ent entirely uh, driven by Android and uh, uh, entirely accessible through the Braille keyboard. That is very cool. Yeah. One cool gadget I have coming, and I don't know if you're a musician, Sean, but it's called the Roadie 2. It's a guitar tuner, and Steve actually has the first generation. I, I'm not, but can cool. you tell me about it? Oh, Steve, can you explain it since you have one? Well, mine, the, the Roadie 1 worked through your, uh, through your smartphone. So you run an app on your smartphone, and you use the mic on your smartphone as the, uh, the receiver, I guess you would say, for it. The, the tuner itself Bluetooth pairs to your phone, and uh, you basically stick it on a peg on your on your instrument, in my case a guitar, and uh, pluck the string, and it starts 
turning until it gets the, the note dead on. And then you just pick it up and put it on the next one. Now, the, the one Ryan's got, I believe, has its own microphone built in. And it does everything just within the tuner itself, doesn't it? Uh, no, you still need the app. Do you still need the app? Yeah, yeah. still done through the app. I've also got a roadie bass coming in 2018. It's not ready yet. But... Oh. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, it'll help help me. Who's you know, I'm totally blind, Sean. So, you know, being able to tune my instruments has always been kind of hit and miss. I have different apps that do it, but you only get so close. And this should right. help me get more precise. So, pretty cool. Yeah. Well, that's the thing about assistive technology. Like, you know, to have this stuff makes it so much easier. And and have you looked at the kind of research the background of why somebody developed it because when you think of things like siri right siri exists because somebody needed it not because somebody wanted it but we all just take for granted that it's out there for everybody to use it makes life a little bit easier yeah yeah absolutely well and i was just trying to think in my head i was like well what what at is there in terms of like learning and i mean really the main ones would be uh things like obviously dragon um, there, you know, dyslexia software. Yeah, Kurzweil, text help, things, things like that. What about MindView? Yeah, MindView is a great tool. I love MindView. It's a mind mapping software. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, but really, I mean, there, there. I don't know. It's there's not a heck of a lot out there. You know, again, for the for invisible disabilities. Well, and I mean, it's going to depend on how that invisible disability affects you too, right? Sure. You know, it's, yeah, and how how you learn? Like I use Inspiration mind mapping software, and I, and I enjoy that a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the I don't know if you guys have used it before, but one of the cool yeah. features is that after you've kind of linked everything together, you can transfer it to a Word document. Yeah, yeah. MindView does the same thing. My, MindView is basically Inspiration on speed. It uh, it has a, a lot of additional features over and above what uh, what Inspiration has. Well, I'm going to look that up. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's it's really good. It's, it also uh, is. Uh, uh, really built around uh, project management as well. So it's got a lot of project management tools in it and um, it interfaces not just with uh, Word but also uh, Excel, PowerPoint uh, and what's their, uh, I think it's called Microsoft Project, their project management tool. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, uh, it's pretty slick. It's uh, uh, from a company called Matchware. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at it right now. Because <laughs> uh, one of the things that I I find challenging is that you know I'm I'm always looking for a system that works, mm -hmm. and I haven't found the right one yet, which makes me think that I need to create it. But <laughs> the other billion things I'm doing, uh, it's not a priority. But you know, when somebody recommends something, I you know I try to make a point to to check it out because you never know, maybe that'll be the one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, at our, our previous company we worked for, uh, Aroga Technologies represented that that uh, that line, and um, uh, you know I got the the demo versions of it, and I found it it just totally changed the way that I anytime I did a PowerPoint I started in in MindView, anytime I did a document I started in MindView, um, just for organizational purposes, and then you know did did the bulk of the the layout in there and then you know, dumped it into word for, for, you know, final cleanup and stuff. But, uh, yeah, but it, it for, it, it went from, you know, a, a tool that we'd, we'd brought in specifically for people with uh, learning disabilities and it ended up being my number one tool. So cool. Yeah. I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna check that out. Try it out. Yeah. Yeah. There's a free demo you can download. I'm definitely going to do that. Thanks for the, thanks for the tip. No worries. All right, so just send us some lobster next season. <laughs> <laughs> You'll have to come and get it. <laughs> Fair. Fair I'm, I'm not, you know, I get, uh, I'm not a typical New Brunswicker or Maritimer. Like, I, I don't like lobster, really. Um, I like fish and chips, but I've never been a big lobster lobster fan. I For the for the amount of money it costs, I'd rather have a nice rack of ribs or yeah. a juicy steak. I'm with you. Yeah. I'm with you, buddy. Yeah, I prefer the beef, too. I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll, yeah, well, I'll take all your you lobsters. To, I know. Yeah, well, you I'm an Alberta boy. <laughs> you don't have to. I'm a BC boy. You don't have to cook a cow alive to get it. I mean, that's, that's so creepy. <laughs> We're not going to get into how you boil it. Exactly. It's <laughs> a terrible. conversation where it gets too controversial. 
Yeah, people who like lobsters, they're just lucky that lobsters aren't cute. Because otherwise there'd be a, a <laughs> lot <fluffy>. of backlash. <laughs> <laughs> they're lucky they're ugly. Hmm. Sea bugs. Yeah, Are sea they, bugs. They, they still get eaten. <laughs> yeah. Rob, Rob's going to start an organization for lobster rights. <laughs> I'm thinking about it. Lobster, lobster lives matter. <laughs> yeah. Please don't sign that petition. Please don't sign that petition. <laughs> Unless you want it to be made fun of. <laughs> Sean, right. thank you so much for joining us today. This was it was awesome. It was great to talk to you. Likewise. Take care. All okay. right, you as well. All right. Bye bye. Actually that that does sound really interesting. Like you know, the more he talked about it, the more I was like, man, like this The approaches it seems everybody's taking is all wrong. Yeah. You know? And it makes complete sense when he lays it out like that. Like just you you why why try to change the individual? You need to be changing the system. It, it's a little mind boggling too, when you think about, you know, all of these years, the education system has essentially failed uh, a, a couple of generations. Yeah. Or mm -hmm. well, every generation previous um, to now and, and is continuing to, to fail a lot of our kids now um, by not having proper diagnostics yeah. To determine what their best learning medium is or, you know, what their, what their strengths and, and weaknesses are. Well, and I think too, you know, like back when I was in school, you know, I failed grade eight and I, I'm sure I had some sort of learning disability, but we have friends whose son is supposed to graduate this year or next year, maybe next year, but they don't fail kids anymore. They push them through and they push them through. Like there's no repeating grades. Well, they, they fail courses, not, right. not grades. Yeah. Yeah. So I just found that really interesting, you know, that they can just keep pushing them through. So well, they still have to get their credits to graduate, though. Right. They still have to pass enough courses to, to graduate. Right. But I guess they can they alter their courses. They just don't hold them back. Or, yeah, well, yeah, they, they just don't, don't hold, hold them back, back from, yeah. Cause, yeah. and honestly, that's that's better, I think. I mean, there's nothing weirder than being in grade nine and there's some guy with a mustache sitting across from you. Yeah. But then you get, you know, you get pushed through and you don't have the life skills. You don't have, you don't have the knowledge that you're going to need in the real world to succeed. Yeah. Well, but again, I think this, this comes back to his point where, you know, it's not the, the solution to the problem isn't just keep continuing to hold them back. Right. I think the yeah. solution to the problem is, you know, address the issue, address the issues. Yeah. And, you know, uh, you think about how many adults are out there that are probably just suffering from these things and they just think, well, you know what? I'm just stupid mm -hmm. or I'm just really bad at organizing myself or I'm just, yeah. that's just kind of the way I am without realizing that, you know what? there are solutions out there or they don't even, they don't even know they have it. And that's, you know, the, the, the that's why I think the concept of invisible disabilities is very important. I am currently on, on track to get a guest on the show to talk about, um, mental illness and people with disabilities. Yeah. I so. think, yeah, I think that this is sort of, we haven't really tapped into that mm -hmm. much on the podcast, but it would be nice to, to open it up and, and talk to more people in that, in that industry and, and, uh, start talking about these issues because they're very important as well. Absolutely. Yeah. You, you got me thinking about, um, uh, an article that I read a while back about, um, learning disabilities and uh, prison populations. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a, there's a very, very high, uh, correlation between, uh, people with uh, a variety of learning disabilities, um, and criminality because they don't get a proper education right? and their problems go unaddressed and they end up in trouble yeah. because they can't earn a, a living through legitimate means. So, you know, this is a huge societal issue for us mm -hmm. yeah. and, uh, and, and one that, you know, with some resources being addressed at the early going could save us billions down the road. Well, and I think we have to be careful because it seems like, you know, and correct me if I'm wrong, you know, maybe five to 10 years ago, that was their first go-to diagnosis right. is let's give everybody Renalin. Yeah. And yeah. now hopefully that has changed and they're actually doing some more, you know, personal diagnoses of, of the person with the invisible disability and not just, you know, pulling out the prescription pad and 
writing well, a prescription. And that's totally doctor dependent. Yes. You know, there's yeah. good doctors and there's bad doctors out there. There are the doctors out there who will fling pills at any problem without right. full, full diagnosis. Um, and, and you know, that's dangerous. Yeah. You know, there needs to be that, that, uh, diagnostic component to it. Well, there is, because it could very well be that, you know, it's just a wrong diagnosis and Ritalin is doing nothing to actually solve mm-hmm. the problem. I mean, it's great, you know, in Sean's case where that was, that's what was needed. Right. And that helped him. Uh, but for somebody else, like say, say for Abby, with, in your story, Steve, yeah. it, Ritalin would have done nothing for her if they would have diagnosed her with ADHD. And, 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 prescribed and you know what? The specialist teacher at her school actually told us at one point that we should go to our doctor and get her medicated for ADHD. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. And how many kids were medicated? You that know? didn't need to. Then. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, we, we could have gone into our doctor and said, Hey, you know, her teacher says that she's got ADHD and needs medication. Now. I would hope that our family doctor would say, oh, well, let's hook you up with a psychologist and you do, know, some tests do some and tests and, and, and see, mm-hmm. but path of least resistance would be to fling that medication at us and go, well, yeah, sure. Give her, give her a try. See what happens. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know? yep. Well, very important work that he's doing and he has a podcast on top of that. I tell you, we need to step it up, boys. Indeed, we're underachievers, man. <laughs> uh, well, speaking of underachieving, shall we get out of here? Yeah, get out of here. Yeah. All right. Well, hey, Ryan. Rob. Where can people find us? They can find us online at atbanter.com. What? Surprise. What? You didn't do the Wubbies? <laughs> nope. Damn. 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 Wow. Uh, they can also email us if they so desire, atbanterpodcast at gmail.com. Yes, indeedy. And uh, they can also find us on Facebook at atbanter. And they can find us on Twitter at at underscore banter. Correct. And where the heck can they find you online, Steve? Well, Canadian Assistive Technology can be found online at www.canastech.com, C-A-N-A-S-S-T-E-C-H. Yes, there is an ass in the middle of my company name. There's also one running the company. Oh, mm. damn, you stole my joke. <laughs> I, I saw it I was waiting. I saw it coming. <laughs> the lob came up. I was ready to spike it down on you. <laughs> We should also give a shout out to Mr. Rick Chant from Chaos Technical Services. You can find him online at www.chaostechnicalservices.com. And he can fix anything except your cat. Oh, he might even be able to fix a cat. I don't know. Uh, it's probably dependent on what's wrong with he's, the cat. He's, in, he's, in, he's from Newfoundland. Duct tape. Nova Scotia. Whatever. Duct tape and jingle sticks. <laughs> fix anything. <laughs> Uh, all right. Well, that's going to do it for us, everybody. Thanks for listening in. I have been Robin O. I have been Ryan Flurry. Oh, wait. I, no, I well, haven't. Oh, what? Oh, oh, okay. okay. Yeah. Car crash. No, no, no. Oh. apparently I'm Steve Barkley. All right. And I guess I'll be Ryan Flurry. That's and good plan. We will see everybody next week. This podcast has been brought to you by Canadian Assistive Technology, providing low vision and blindness solutions across Canada. Find us online at www.canastech.com. That's C-A-N-A-S-S-T-E-C-H dot com. Or call us toll free at 1-844-795-8324. For all your assistive technology servicing needs, call Chaos Technical Services at 778 778- 847-6840 or find them online at chaostechnicalservices.com Music provided by bensound.com <laughs> <laughs>